toxicity causing POTS? And that is an interesting question because so let's do a little let's do a little story on B6 so people know what that is. Uh, pyroxene B6, right? B vitamin, wonderful stuff. We need it. We need a good amount of it. With toxicity, you can see that people can start to develop problems in the peripheral nerves primarily. And when you when that happens and you irritate the peripheral nerves, you get things that resemble neuropathies, right? So you get tingly, numb, um, you know, pain at sometimes, all sorts of things. And in severe cases, then we can start to see it affect more central things, or we can affect the autonomic nerves to the point where we start to develop autonomic problems. Now, whether that comes to yield POTS or not is a question of severity and where it affects. And then number two is the consideration that sometimes that toxicity can worsen or exacerbate symptoms if we're already in the environment of, of that, okay? So yeah, I mean, I think that's the basics. Like the main way that you get it is just by over consuming. Sometimes there's a metabolic problem where you, you have a hard time clearing it out um, and that can overwhelm the system as well. So just things to consider, but is it possible? Yeah, is it common? Not so much, but you can measure these things and be able to see where you're at and then figure out, um, do we need to reduce the ingestion? Do we need to look into the metabolic pathways? Understand a little bit more there, but I wouldn't say that it is probably like the leading cause in the world. So how do you start walking when you have POTS, long COVID, balance issues, et cetera? That's a tough question because there's a lot of different pieces to it, right? And we don't know why. I think the, the better maybe frame of that question might be to, to start to think about how do we start increasing activity levels? One of the things that we know is that just allowing, it's kind of like I have, um, my friend Mike is a, is an airplane mechanic. And we talk about airplanes. I dream about airplanes. Um, I'm too scared to fly them. He flies them, but I'm too scared. I'm a wimp. And, but we tell, he talks about, you know, planes and working on, he says like, you have to run them. They're not, they don't do well if you don't run them. So they have to be used. And that's part, like using them helps keep them healthy. And it's like, man, if that's not an obvious corollary to humans, I don't know what is. And so what we're thinking about here, Brenda, is, is like, we got to be like an airplane. We work better when we're being used. So maybe walking isn't quite on the table yet, right? That's the goal. That's where we're headed. But maybe that's not where we're starting from. And that might mean contextually putting you in a position where you can still use your body to some degree. And it doesn't have to be a ton. It's just adding movement to the system again, kind of like, you know, greasing up the tin man and being able to start to run those systems so they get they get used to running again. So the example of that might be sometimes we have to just people can't be upright. They just, you know, like we saw here, if we can't get people to just stay upright and get blood in their head, then we probably don't want to exercise them while they're also trying to get blood in their head. Like those are two things that are hard that we're not able to do, which is the reason that we're not feeling well in the first place. So if we take gravity out of the scenario and we let people lay down to where they don't have to solve that problem right now, but we let that system run, flush the fluids, get the muscles going, get your breathing up a little bit, get that under control, then sometimes that helps us to be able to get that machine going in a way where we can do more. So the question to think about, Brenda, might be, what do we, where, where are you? What kinds of things can you do? Can you do it for a minute, right? Can you lay down and, and cycle your legs for a minute? Can you, you know, lay down and do circles with your arms for 20 seconds? And then you just start where you can start. And then as simple as it is, is the next day, you just try to do the same and maybe a little bit more. Um, James Clear wrote a really good book, Atomic Habits. And what he talks about is not setting the threshold or like the goal so high that it feels hard to do every time. So like if I go in to work out and I say like every day I'm going to, you know, do max deadlifts. I can't do that every day. I'm not going to be able to do 400 pounds every day. And so I'll lose and that will affect my motivation. But if you can say, I'm just going to lay down and I'm going to move my legs for 30 seconds. And if you can do that 30 seconds and you can do that pretty easily, maybe you can do it. Maybe you just have to say, I just have to pick my legs up one time. And as long as I pick my legs up one time, it counts. And then you just see what you can do from there. The rest is all bonus, right? 
And then where you make a living is in the bonus. So you set the goal super low, something you can easily do every single day. And then everything else is just upside from there. And you just try to build a little, just show up and do that goal a little bit every day. Now, when we look at the other parts, POTS, long COVID, balance problems, et cetera, these are things that may have to be handled more specifically so that we're not bleeding off a lot of energy in trying to you know, manage these symptoms, but actually start to shift that energy toward healing. And then once we shift it toward healing, can we shift it toward improving our capacity, right? So anybody who's in a state where you have to do a large amount of healing, your energy needs to go to that. But we need to be able to not have a hole in the gas tank as we're trying to heal it. In other words, we can't be um, constantly like beating the system up without a good mechanism of recovery. And that might be what, what the key point is here. Is having a hypoplastic left vertebral artery relevant in POTS or is this a normal anatomic variant? Great question. And the answer, I'll give you the quick answer then the long answer. So the answer to the question, is this normal does it, is it relevant in POTS or is it normal? It can be both. Okay, so what does it mean? Let's do that first. So a hypoplastic vertebral artery on the left side is going to mean that the arteries that are coming up, so we have, we kind of have it set up like this, where there are two carotid arteries that come up the front and they go up and kind of up through here. They turn in the middle cerebral, anterior cerebral, and they, they kind of inter, or excuse me, they kind of fuel this area up here. And then the vertebral arteries come by the vertebrae in the back and they go up and it kind of makes a little circle in the brain, but they do some, some more of the, uh, the irrigation in the back part of the brain and in the brain stem. Okay. <clears throat> it's not uncommon that when you actually look at the arterial systems in people, like through an MRA, then you'll see sometimes they develop a little bit differently. So some of them will be really robust, really clear, really nice, beautiful highways. And sometimes you'll have them that just don't form real well. So they don't actually like transmit a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of blood. And <clears throat> that's why we have this circle at the top because sometimes it just doesn't work as well. So we have to use blood from a, one of the different segments to wrap around and fill one of the other ones. So with a hypoplastic artery, sometimes that can be problematic if we see a decrease in the overall flow rate. In other words, this is probably something that happens in development, right? And your brain, as it's developing, can kind of start to shift or it can adapt to that change in blood flow. And for some people, they're totally fine. They can get enough blood coming through one of the other arteries. It makes up for the whole thing and they do great. Other people, if the brain doesn't adapt to it as well, may be more prone to if they if they do a certain amount of activity or if they have a certain type of a head movement that they actually decrease the flow and then we start to see symptoms, right? So an example of that could be if I've got a left hypoplastic one, it means I don't have enough fluid or enough blood coming up. So I may, I may, we don't know, but I may rely on this right one more, right? So it's feeding both sides cool. But sometimes we know that with a big head turn to the left, it can have the tendency to cause compression in that artery in the back. And so if that right one in the posterior is the one that's feeding the whole thing, then I may find I'm more susceptible to a bow hunter syndrome or, or a problem with that artery getting closed. And then I'm affecting the whole thing. So I'm more likely to be really symptomatic in that sense, right? So there are kind of lots of ways that this can work depending on how the rest of the system is able to adapt for that hypoplasia. And so then can it affect POTS? Might you find that when that level drops, I try to compensate for it with a heart rate? That can be a normal response to that. Um, but worth worth probably investigating, especially uh, if we're looking at different, different movements and how they might affect symptoms. So really good question there. I'm gonna sneeze, hold on. <clears throat> 